So let's move on to the next turn, and hopefully everything will go pretty well. I'm a little... All right, all right, I'm a little worried. Uh, yeah, that druid probably made the difference. So this is the downside of having to expand against tough units and uh, having really shitty units to expand with them. Maybe I should have attacked the cavalry, like the seven or so cavalry. They could have been a very tough fight as well and possibly won, I would say, unfortunately. But, uh, as well, uh, but... Uh, I really wanted to get these guys out of the way and get rid of them so I didn't have to worry about what was in this province or maybe sending my pretender into it later. So I decided to go for these guys and it may have been a mistake. Hmm. Yeah, I'm gonna, they're gonna retreat in just a second here probably. Yeah. You know, they finally caught up to the archers to where they could probably eventually finish them off, but that's what happens when your units don't have very good morale. That's why um, units with great morale, especially if they're otherwise good units, are extremely valuable because having a unit continue hacking into the enemy until its last breath, unless it's a flying unit, is usually a good thing. With flying units, they uh, instantly escape the battlefield when they route. Uh, we're going to take a look at our Earth Serpent while I talk here. And instantly escaping the battlefield, uh, if it's not going well for you, is pretty great. You know, you often you'll get a lot of those troops back, um, and you don't have to recruit them again. You just, you know, gather them up with a commander and go out to fight again, and that's fine. Um, sometimes you don't want that. Sometimes you want them to fight to the death to really finish off that enemy army if you need to. But a lot of the time, it's it's not such a big deal if they actually escape. Now, for slow ground units, what usually happens is they die horribly while trying to retreat, and you are very, very, very sad. Uh, in my case, my commander actually retreated to a adjacent province where I'm not going to be able to send him right back out, which really sucks. Um, fortunately, I think... Oh man, now I'm saying this, I'm gonna like get myself killed doing it. But I think the Earth Serpent can expand against these guys. Indie provinces don't regenerate um, units that have been killed, right? They, they they stay dead. So this means that I can expand over here and then I can go this way and kill a bunch of stuff. Um, and I, he, he should probably have an okay time. Uh, that druid is actually very dangerous for your Earth Serpent. He can cast Sleep, um, which I believe is Magic Resist Negates. So I'm probably fine but if it's not magic resistant gates or if say i fail a few times it actually adds like 10 or 20 fatigue which is brutally uh a really brutal debuff um you know it's gonna make a huge difference uh in your effectiveness so you you don't you don't want that you're not a big fan of that so what i'm doing now is i'm changing over recruitment to one of my big awesome powerful bakamono sorcerers Actually, now that I think about that more, I'm not going to do that. Uba are, I believe, let's see, 21 to 13. Yes, Uba are uh, better research speed. I believe they're also better research efficiency at 135 gold. Um, what I mean by that is that, you know, if I recruit Uba for two turns, because it takes two turns to recruit a Bakamono Sorcerer, I'm going to get uh, 26 points of research versus 21 points of research. It's not a big difference, but I don't need my Bakamono Sorcerers anytime soon. They're not good unless I've researched spells for them to cast, which I'm working on. Excuse me. Uh, which I'm working on. I'm going to try and get Fire 3, and then I can get a little bit of Conjuration after my uh, enchantment, and I'm going to cast Flaming Arrows. Uh, but right now, they aren't very useful. Uh, and my Uba will be useful later as well, and they're getting me to the point, they're getting my Bakamono Sorcerers to the point where I'm, they're useful. So that's why I'm recruiting uh, my less powerful mages at the moment. I think we can move on to the next turn. Now, I often don't scout in test games, so I'm trying to remember to do it for your benefit. Uh, you need to be scouting as soon as you can, as hard as you can. Um, you want to look be on the lookout for like a forest province you can capture because forest provinces often have independent scouts and independent scouts you can just recruit them on their province oh look we just slaughtered those guys no problem uh that's great i kind of wonder now what would have happened if i'd sent him against those guys to begin with instead of uh twiddling my thumbs a bit and worrying too much uh but you know i think maybe it was it was the right move not to if i'd gotten this guy killed uh it would be pretty darn bad uh, also, provinces like this make me nervous. Sometimes in Dominions, if you see a province with a freakishly small number of units, it's because um, 
the rest of like of the value of how difficult that province is, is supposed to be to take is being taken up by mages like uh air mages are notoriously horrible to fight they summon lots of uh annoying illusions that'll slow you down death mages can be really bad as well in general fighting a province as independent mages is going to be really nasty and sometimes there are special units that you won't have seen that are going to be there and are going to make your life miserable um so you want to you want to look out for that uh and, uh, you know, like, there's not necessarily much you can do about it in these sort of situations. Like, I really need to attack into these provinces next to my cap circle in order to get more production so I can recruit more units. You know, right now, I cannot recruit nearly enough units per turn. I really want to be sending out another army very soon in one or two turns. And it's pretty difficult to pull off when I'm only recruiting... How many dudes am I recruiting? Like, uh... I don't know, it's probably like 15 guys, I don't want to count it, but probably like 15 guys, that's not enough. I want to be recruiting like 20 guys per turn, so in two turns I'll have 40 dudes, and that's that's a pretty reliable way to take out a province. So, we're going to check out my research, I'm doing fine. If I was researching something to only level 1, like if I was a communion nation, so I want just level 1 thaumaturgy, um, which you would if you were a communion nation, you'd want to try and put exactly 50 points of research into this and put the rest into something else because you're kind of in a race here. You want to get to your research objective as quickly as reasonably possible without like sacrificing your good expansion and missing out on provinces that you're going to need to win the game later. All right, so we did much better against these horse tribe cavalry. They weren't a trap. They were just normal cavalry. So were these guys. That's really great to see. Um, I'm glad our commander did not die to a large spider. You know, that that, that sounds like an epic battle. We're going to take a quick detour to launch this uh, and fast forward. Oh, oh, it was not actually like a large battle spider. It was like, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know if anyone from Australia is going to watch this, but I'm sure you've seen bigger spiders there. Um, so let's see. This guy managed to survive, and he became a hero from the assassination attempt. Unequal to obesity. Oh, that's great. I was I was really hoping he'd become inspirational. That would be hilarious and very powerful, actually. So we're going to move on to this province here. Um, I'm going to attack on with the Earth Serpent now. You might wonder, oh, well, why am I not taking this uh, Lost Lands? And, you know, there's, there's a reasonably good reason to try taking the lost lands right here um because it's next to my capital it'll give me more production but i'm suspicious of a province with this says it's free from enemy military units i don't know if that's even possible um so i kind of expect whoever to attack into there to die and i'd rather it not be my prophet and his army i think i can expand out here quite a ways safely without them uh, or with them excuse me uh and right now I'm, I'm actually starting to get comfortable with my amount of unit production per turn uh if i was a little bit more hard up for such things i might not be so i'm going to just uh move on and then this next force i'm sending out is going to be a little bit weaker a little bit less important and either this is really going to be easy and they'll take it no problem or it's going to be very difficult they'll all die and i'll be somewhat less sad than if my prophet had died now i, I found another nation that's i want to say um but maybe it's solaria pretender pretenders of the world here's another useful thing you can if you spot someone's flag you can take a look at the pretenders of the world and see who the hell it is um it is Ulm. what do you know uh and you know you can look up their nation and you know consider how much of a threat to you they may be um it's a little possibly a little bit more relevant in multiplayer games uh if you've been playing the same community for a while maybe you know who they are who's playing that nation and how dangerous they might be to you um but it's good that we found them. We're going to go and lead our scout into their territory and take a look at what they're doing and see if maybe, you know, they're someone we could easily kill or if we should be shoring up our borders and getting ready for a fight because they could invade us early and kill us potentially. Uh, scouting information in this game is super important. And I've this is my like third take at making this video at this point. Uh, I tried to go over this in my our Casa Fail introduction and that was a mistake. And then I made another video and it didn't go very well. I had to, I'm having to redo it now, uh, and I keep saying, oh man, you know, indie scouting is very important, you know, and uh, indie scouts are very common, you'll find a province with indie scouts, and you're going to want to, you know, immediately uh, start recruiting your indie scouts, and spread them across the world, and you know what, I have not encountered a single province with indie scouts in three games of trying this, oh my goodness, hmm, you know what, that's my fault. So what I did there was I didn't read this carefully enough, and it probably said consists of heavy cavalries and light cavalries, and I should have known that uh, this would happen, really. Like, 
it, it should have been quite obvious, but you know, I was talking to you, you see with the, the microphone and uh, not paying very close attention to what the hell was going on and I got my entire army killed. So, of course, you know, with, with some nations, it's a lot more forgiving. If you're playing like a heavy bless early Miklon, you send Jaguar warriors in there, right? That's their great sacred unit you're not going to have a problem. So some nations are a lot more forgiving. This is not one of them. This is a nation where you need to be kind of on point. And there's a lot, there's a decent number of nations like this in Dominions. And this is why I've chosen to start with this nation for my tutorial video example, right? Um, because I don't want to just show you me rolling over these provinces and having a really easy time of it. In fact, uh, I do a little better usually if I'm paying attention and taking my time in a like play-by-email game where maybe I have an hour to look at every turn if I really wanted to. And I try and make sure my early expansion is very perfect. Um, but, you know, I've also made these kind of mistakes fairly often in um, uh, lane games, you know. Dominion, there's a pretty good Dominions group uh, from 4chan, actually, or originating from 4chan on Steam called uh, Vanheim. And uh, I've played some games with them before, and I've made mistakes like this doing those because, you know, the turns are on a fairly short timer, like, you know, two to five minutes uh, early on in the game. And you have to actually pay attention and move pretty quick. Ah, see, you know what? Look at this. All right, so this is a great example of one of those trap lands. And actually, I captured it. But these are very dangerous uh especially to your pretender. This guy's a fire mage, which is actually one of the least threatening things I could have bumped into. Death mages and air mages are really scary. Fire mages, not so much. You know, he set a couple of my troops on fire, but ultimately this is actually easier than most indie provinces. It's certainly a lot easier than heavy cavalry because, and there they go, my units are gonna slaughter this small amount of in infantry. I'm gonna get to swarm around them and surround them and kill them all. And then the mage is gonna be pretty much defenseless. Um, Although you'll note that he's almost the only thing that's done much damage to my troops at this point. I don't know if... Yeah, it looks like he's going to have done the most, the majority of the damage. Uh, so you got to look out for things like this, because he could have easily been, like, two uh, cloud walkers, I think the air mages are usually called, with air two. And then they could be casting lightning bolts, which are very accurate, or they could be creating illusions, and they could have had a larger army. Maybe it would have been... Or maybe they've had some cavalry, like those... Uh, those uh, horse tribe cavalry that turned out to not be too threatening um, after all. So I think we're gonna have to do a take two with these heavy cavalry. Um, I'm not super confident that I'm going to succeed. I'm actually going to change around my unit recruitment now too to help me out with this. Um, not super confident that I'll succeed with those guys, but I, I think the odds are pretty in my favor now that there aren't so many of them. Hmm. All right. Ah, here's something you should also be on the lookout for when you're expanding. Now, if you find a province that ha mysteriously has some scales up here, right? Uh, if, you, if it mysteriously has like death three, there's going to be actually a reason for that. It's not just going to be a mystery. Um, it's going to be that. Oh, you know. I did, I, <laughs> all right. I've been playing this game since um, I want to say 2014. And uh, I've never realized the scales actually visually tip when uh, there's a lot more of one than the other. That's super cool. All right, well, um, so this has death three scales, right? And it's got my dominion on it, not someone else's dominion. That, 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 what that means is that there is a uh, sacred, uh, excuse me, sacred, um, not sacred. There's a special uh, magic site on this province that's causing that. And if I look here... Oh, he doesn't have disease. Inkpot End is this one particular province I often expect to do that. Um, it's it's obviously called Inkpot End, like I just said, and it causes unrest. Oh, look, we've got unrest. And death scales, and it will disease troops that, uh, damn it, still, no, oh my god, crossbows, oh man, man. Still no, still no foreign recruit scouts. We're gonna, we're gonna look around and see if I can find a for, freaking foreign recruit scout, but it doesn't look like I'm in luck. Ah, here we go. These are indie scouts. They are great. They are sometimes better than your national scouts, and you want, like, mm, ten of them. It depends on the size of the map and the number of the players, but you want a lot of scouts. And you want to cover the map with scouts and focus them on the nations near you that you think you're going to have to fight soon. But you want to know what's going on. You want to know when other nations are involved with wars with each other. And scouting, I feel, is indeed part of expansion, because you need to, early on, like, we're in 
fall in the in the first year, which means we're still like uh, in under 12 turns. Uh, and we've got indie scouts, and we want to start recruiting indie scouts now, so that by turn 20 or so, we're going to have just covered this place in indie scouts, and we we'll probably want to keep going because a lot of them are going to get killed, and they're also not very expensive. That's something very important you need to keep an eye out for, because as soon as you get a province that has those, you want to start recruiting them. Let's move on with the Earth Serpent. Um, we probably want to send our next army this way. Hopefully these guys will succeed. Um, you can press J, by the way, if you didn't know, to uh, go to any units that you haven't given commands yet. And I highly recommend going into the options and setting it up so that units, uh, that if you try to end, let's say, try to end the turn, right, and you haven't given a commander a command, it will warn you. Um, very rarely do you actually leave your commander sitting around. Right now would be a good example of a time. I'm just going to have him patrol so it doesn't give me the annoying notice. And we're going to go on to the next turn. We're beaten. Oh, so we killed one cavalry and ran away. Ah, oh, jeez, these guys are really kicking my ass. Okay, we're going to give up on fighting them, and, well, with those units. We're going to take our better commander. 20 heavy count? How many were actually there? Jeez. Oh, that's where my earth serpent kicked butt. Oh, uh, not that many heavy cavalry. Now, heavy cavalry are very dangerous, but most of the nations you're going to play won't have this much of a problem with them. You probably would have just killed those guys and gone home by now. But Shinuyama is not very good at expansion. Expansion is just it's just not their specialty. And uh, they have quite a difficult time dealing with units that are really tough, like uh, heavy cavalry. Let's look at the, the stats of heavy cavalry. I'll talk about why they're so nasty really briefly. Um, they have three attacks. The Lance, I think, only hits one. Yes, once in each battle. So when they first run into you, they, they kill someone with the Lance. It's got a charge bonus. It deals a huge amount of damage. Pretty much instantly kills somebody. And then they're going to hit you with a broadsword, which probably instantly kills somebody for your weak units that aren't very heavily armored. And they're probably going to hit you with a hoof, too, which um, also probably instantly kills somebody, which because your units are weak and poorly armored and then the next round they're gonna hit you with the broadsword and hoof again and kill two more somebodies because your troops are poorly armored and taking a lot of damage like that all at once is gonna probably lead to a morale check very quickly and your units are gonna run away because they're cowardly um and these guys have protection 15 so you can only just barely deal damage to them and, and they have defense skill 16 so you're often gonna hit their kite shield and then you're not going to deal damage to them until you get past that, which is going to take a few attacks, and it's just, they're just really annoying to deal with because of their large first strike damage as well. We're going to start sending out our scout. They're very risky to, a, to kill with a pretender like this because they can uh, deal a serious wound on the first hit that can uh, cripple them for the rest of the battle, battle such as the actual wound crippled, uh, which is going to, I think it massively reduces your defense, it might reduce your attack as well, and slows you down, and it puts your, your pretender in a very poor position to win any sort of fight with that, them from that point onwards. Um, so they're very hard to deal with because of that. Something you might want to do, and I think I'm going to try this here, is... Oh, uh, nope, nothing good. You can hire mercenaries. You're usually only going to do that if you want to, like, really pump out a huge expansion force. Or if you're a nation like Shinuyama that struggles just to get the, um, like, normal amount of nations you would expect anyone to have. Which, in the case of this map, and in most games you'll play, is about 15. Um, which is it's what I'm trying to get to by a little bit after year one. I'm not doing very well right now. Oh look, we had a cloud mage. So these are these are one of the guys that they only have this one only has air one, so not too bad, but these are some of the guys that can actually be pretty dangerous, especially for expansion pretenders. Um But it looks like this time it wasn't a big deal. Often what can happen is if they are paired with like heavy cavalry, then they go from pretty annoying and potentially deadly to some weak expansion forces or pretenders to extremely dangerous. Uh Deer tribe are also deceptively dangerous. They have um, shamans with water or, or nature one magic, and uh, they cast a uh, vine arrow. And vine arrow roots you in place and makes it hard for you to def defend yourself. So oftentimes, if your pretender is hit by vine arrow, they will get just slammed for huge amounts of damage and die. And you know nobody wants that. So that can be something that's you gotta watch out for. 
Unfortunately, there's a water nation, uh, and since I Brian just randomed up a bunch of nations, so you might sometimes use the Earth Serpent to expand into the water. If there is no water nation, that's a very good option, but this time I'm not going to be able to. I'm just going to try and expand into these deer tribe, uh, because I'm confident that the Earth Serpent is a badass and can probably handle himself. So now I've got an army that might actually be fairly competent over here. Um, I'm probably going to just roll these guys out as one huge group. Um, despite the fact that I recruited uh, the guys with bows, I may make them attack closest. Uh, it's not a very effective use of the fact that they have bows, because the, the ones who only have swords do have slightly better combat stats. Not something that's very relevant, or relevant very often, but it exists. And so if you're not going to be using their bows for anything, you would be better off taking them. So, you know, at this point, it's like a matter of pride. I'm going to have to I'm gonna have to take down these heavy cavalry. I kind of suspect my prophet with tougher units is going to have an okay time of it because of his ability to smite units. And there are only tough cavalry left, but they're still going to die about instantly to smite. So I think we are ready to send them on. Let's check on our research really quick. We're at research three. We want research four for flaming arrows. We're actually coming up on that very quickly since we're just recruiting Uba. Now... At this point, I think we're going to start recruiting Bakamono Sorcerers. You might say, oh, why are you going to recruit Bakamono Ah, you know what? I'm second-guessing myself. I'm not going to recruit Bakamono Sorcerers, but we're going to have to in a little bit. Uh, the reason I realized I don't want to is that I don't just need uh, three more turns of research, right? I also need Conjuration 3. So I'm going to let this go one more turn before we start recruiting Bakamono Sorcerers. So let's advance to the next turn. It's always a very sad time to see you only taking one province when you in a turn when you took an awake expander at this point in the game all right now oh, i got a free guy that's always nice this this province looks fairly weak and nice so i'm gonna go ahead and take it and uh move out that way um this guy isn't gonna be good for much over here where i randomly acquired him so i'm gonna have him just site search, which is nice. Um, hopefully, you know what site searching is at least. Um, but if you don't, it lets you find magic sites in the province, which give you gems and other good special effects, or hopefully they're good. Although the ones that are bad typically uh, will always be affecting you even before you know about them. So, you know, not site searching doesn't help you at all. You're just missing out on good, beneficial, magical effects. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but I've been putting one defense, one province defense is what we call this, uh, in each of my provinces. Typically, you don't need more than one province defense. There are some very bad events that will kill one province defense, but it's not very economical to put 10 or so on every province, which is often the most you would want to put on it. Um, provinces that I suspect could be attacked by a light force, I might put 10 on it to keep them safe. Provinces that are particularly valuable to me and are generating unrest for some reason, I might put 10 defense on. If I'm building a fort, um, which I think I will start doing right here, um, I will put 15 province defense on a province usually. It doesn't have to be exactly 15, but at 10 province defense, you start get, getting unrest reduction, which is a useful effect to get more income out of a province and, uh, you know, fend off some magical effects that increase unrest in a province, which can be bad because eventually uh, it stops you from recruiting units. And if you move up to 15, you get one patrol strength, which is nice it's not it's not a huge difference but if you're patrolling with other units this gets added to your patrol strength to try and find scouts and you want a little protection here if you're going to start building a castle because you can be interrupted when you're building a castle and you'll lose all of your money that you spent on building that castle and castles are expensive all right moving on to the next turn and i hope this is the turn i said i was going to start recruiting uh my big mage is not the other turn, or that would be embarrassing. Ring of the Warrior gained. Awesome. All right, so we're going to start recruiting Bakamono Sorcerers now. And uh, we can recruit a little bit more of these guys. That's great. Um, and we killed those stupid cavalry that have been spiting us for so long. It just took seven Bakamono show. You know, did I even set up my army well? <laughs> nope, I didn't. Wow. Um... Don't do what I just did there. I think it would be fair to characterize that as a major error. Um, you you really don't want to not give your troops commands. They don't just sit around doing nothing, but what they do instead is whatever the hell they feel like it. Um, this often leads to them killing themselves pretty horribly, uh, which is, you know, bad. Uh, 
and it'll almost never lead to them doing anything more effective than the commands you could give them yourself, so don't do that. Um, you know, I mentioned you want to expand in lines, typically, but morale is important, too. Uh, another thing is, sometimes you want to put, like, bait units out in the front. And there's two ways you can go with that. Um, and by bait units, I mean units that will um, be attacked by archers because they're closer or have more hit points or both. Um, and there's two ways you can go with bait units. You can put out really cheap, really crappy units that don't have any armor, and you expect to die because it doesn't affect you, really, if they do get shot up by arrows. Or you can put units that have really good armor and are really resistant to taking damage from arrows out front so that you can protect your, you know, crappy, lightly armored units that might deal pretty decent damage. Alright, so... We've got to deal with some horse tribe cavalry here. Our only other option really is to back off. I don't want to do that, so I'm going to try expanding into them. We've got a big enough army that we may be able to fight the horse tribe cavalry, although it's going to be pretty tough. Here, we, we should have a decent number of these guys now. Yeah. So since I don't have, I just don't really have the option to recruit a lot of these guys, I'm going to be using them as a arrow, and just sort of an arrow uh, guard. Hmm, I think there's a, I feel like there's a the word for this. I'm gonna be using them as bait, like I mentioned earlier, uh, and the arrow bait. And these guys are gonna just be firing at the closest enemy units in a line formation, and uh, I should be able to kill a lot of things. If you're wondering why I did that, it's because you stupid commander will often walk up into your troops and uh, sit where he can be shot by arrows. And then like a lucky arrow will hit him in the face, and if your troops don't have any commander, they will all retreat which often leads to a lot of them dying and then you can't expand with them anymore and you're just gonna have a really bad time and be sad so you don't want to you don't want to typically leave your commander in a place where you can be easily killed and that's one benefit to having a commander who's a giant or some other type of thing that's very tough to kill ah limp see half ap less attack less defense uh he's less likely to hit people people hit him more easily and he has a really hard time walking over to people to murder them which is actually probably the biggest penalty he mostly wins from his fear aura which slowly reduces people's morale until they flee in terror uh, as it kind of would imply um, but that means he needs to catch up to them first, right? He, it, it, the Fear Aura 5 means that it affects units in a 5 square radius from him. And if he isn't within 5 squares of them, it's not going to do anything. So that's something to bear in mind. Um, another really quick point here. In, in things you should not be running your Pretender into, I've mentioned Barbarians, I've mentioned Heavy Cavalry, do not expand into Lizards. They have a really high strength, do a lot of damage, have high attack, I think have multiple attacks with like a Trident and Bite, and their Shamans will curse your Pretender. Now curse doesn't matter too much for the Earth Serpent. It just makes you take more afflictions, right? You're going to heal from afflictions. But it can actually make you take so many afflictions in the same battle that it can cripple your Pretender to, the, to a degree where they can actually kill it, even if they couldn't already, which they probably can. Or at least, you know, have a decent, halfway decent chance at killing it. Uh, I have beat them before with an Earth Serpent, but then after beating them a couple times, probably just due to luck, I thought, oh, I'll just expand into these guys, no problem, and I lost my Earth Serpent on the first turn of a fairly long multiplayer game, and I was not a happy, happy camper in the least. So, we're going to be building our first fort now. Um, This is kind of a late date to build our first fort. I think I pro maybe could have done it a turn sooner, like maybe as soon as I got this province would have been a better time to do it, especially with the particular build I have for Shinuyama. For some nations, you're going to be starved for gold, and it's going to be hard to afford a fort so early on. You might even need to cut back on unit production to do it. I will say it's probably worth it to cut back on unit production to do this um, unless you know that's going to severely impact you in uh, your expansion because the more forts you have the more mages you can produce and mages are the keys to victory um, especially for also a nation like Shinuyama that uses high resource cost units like your Daibakamono or at least would like to be able to use them on occasion uh, you need a lot of forts to be able to reasonably produce a good amount of those units. That said, you can't just place a force for anywhere, right? If I had placed one right here next to my capital, I would have experienced a very severe penalty to resources in my capital, which I 
really don't want, um, especially since your capital is generally superior to any of your other dinky little forts you're going to build. You don't want to be nerfing it on purpose. Um, I could also potentially build a fort right here, but this is a terrible spot. I'm not going to be able to capture either of these provinces, probably. Um, so I'm not going to get resources from them. Uh, and the surrounding provinces don't give a lot of resources. Now, I can't. it, it might be worth it for me to do that anyway. I'm going to do it just because, hey, why not, right? Um, because it's going to get me more mages, and more mages is good. But, let's see how far I can go with this guy. Um, more mages is good, but building forts, if you're, you probably only have so much money to build forts with, uh, especially forts where you're going to recruit mages, you need a temple, which is 400 gold, you need a lab, which is 500 gold, you need a palisades in this case, but for other nations you may need a castle which is 800 gold um palisades are 600 uh which is a, it's a very large amount of money right like it's, it's quite a bit of money in general um i have i got 2400 gold right there that's actually pretty decent i have very good scales on this nation you won't always have scales this good on every nation you play uh you may you, there may be very good reason to pick scales that are less good uh than this uh, especially if you're taking a uh, sacred unit, bless, right? And if you're taking a, a bless, you probably have more expensive units than I'm having to deal with. And so you're going to have to take that into account. All right. So you won't be able to build all the castles you want. And what that means is that you need to build castles in locations where it's useful to build castles. You know, you're not going to build them right next to each other. You're not going to build them next to your capital. Uh, I mean, you can do that in rare certain circumstances, right? Like maybe you have, maybe you don't care about producing troops out of your uh, castles like middle solaria doesn't care about that uh and you just want to put them back to back all right sure that's fine um there's some undead nations where resources aren't relevant just building excuse me a castle thinking of lemuria in particular makes your units better um arguably better anyway uh so then you could put castles back to back but for the most part you're never going to want to do that because you'll cripple your castles by doing that um it's very very bad not not exaggerating here. It's it's not a great move. So, you know, that can be something, that can be a case where it's worth it to delay building a castle, even when you really need one immediately, uh, because building it right now would get you a useless castle. This is early spring in year two. I'm going to go forward one more turn, see how it goes, and then we're going to call it good for our expansion and talk about what's happened so far. And where I would really have liked to have been versus where I got to. All right, this all went much more smoothly after that one very trollish um, cavalry province. So let's go over some mistakes I made. Uh, expanding into that cavalry was probably a bad idea. Um, with the units I had at that particular time, I should have known better and realized that it, my force was gonna die. Um, you know, often you don't want to retreat when you're expanding, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's worth it to plunge your forces headlong into death. Um, I could have walked back to the capital or over here and tried to go over the mountains and kill something easier, uh, and maybe just gotten more troops and I would have had a larger army faster to go kill the cavalry instead of, I, I failed it with the second army, right? Um, I maybe should have gone over the mountains when I had that opportunity to earlier. I wasn't really confident I could win going over the mountains and wanted to get more territory in this area. But that could have been a good idea. I should have recruited this guy. Um, typically, when, when you want when I, I don't know if everyone does this, but whenever I want to build a, a castle or a palisade, it's right on the spot where I, uh, on the profits I captured, I just recruit a guy there rather than moving a guy from somewhere else. I should have recruited a guy there immediately and then started building my palisades because it's important to get your forts up quickly so that you can get your uh, mage production going quickly. Um, maybe I also should have recruited uh, Bakamona sorcerers or started recruiting them a little bit earlier too. That's debatable though because increasing your research speed more faster is more and faster, not, not more faster. I don't think that's a real word, trust me. Um, oh, I also kept researching when I shouldn't have by accident. Oh. Um, doing that faster is, is very good. It's very valuable. Um, but 
I don't want to just get to the point where I can cast Phoenix Power and cast Flaming Arrows uh, in theory because I've researched it. I want to be able to actually do it. And I believe I need, ah, I got lucky, but I believe I need a Fire 3 Bakamono Sorcerer, which is only a 1 in 4 chance of happening. And so since you only get that chance every other turn, it can take some time to get a Bakamono Sorcerer at Fire 3. Now, now that I'm thinking about it, you can, I believe actually cast a spell with a fire 2 bakamono sorcerer and i could cast it right now with this fire 3 with um a fire gem and the spell and that's it so i would probably have in hindsight have started crafting or <laughs> recruiting my bakamono sorcerers earlier uh so that i'd have them available for flaming arrows um so yeah the laundry list is uh be careful about fighting heavy cavalry recruit and uh, commanders and build palisades where and palisades or castles what have you where you need them as fast as you can to uh, get yourself ready for other people invading you or to invade other players uh, and be careful with your research uh, so that you don't waste any let's see here is there anything else we need to cover hmm you know I don't really think so. Ah, the number of provinces that I've captured. Let's count them up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. So this is actually about the number of provinces I would like to have. I'd really like them to be um not so spread out. Like uh, keeping this line of provinces that I've trailed up here, and there's probably a nation over here, a nation over here, a nation down here, that all are going to want to take this stuff from me. It's going to be very difficult. I'll probably have to build a castle up here and recruit a bunch of units and hope no one attacks me and be clever with my diplomacy to, to actually pull that off. It's, it's pretty bad. Um, But I did get the amount of provinces I want, which is about 15 to 17 provinces on a map this size. Um, the 15 to 17, or 15 or so provinces is like the average number of provinces you'll get in a Dominion's game. A small game averages 10 to 12, and a large game averages like 20, right? And by averages, I mean you should take the number of provinces available on the map and divide them by the number of players. And that's about how many provinces you want to take for yourself. If you take that many for yourself, you're doing about on average. If you take less than that, you're doing more poorly than average um or rather more poorly than what would be expected right the actual you know per player might be a bit varied well excuse me assuming all the indie provinces are taken the average will never change but uh you know someone may end up with 25 provinces because they expanded exceptionally well where you're at 16 and two other poor fools are at like you know five you just don't want to be one of those people. Now, I would say many nations are capable of doing this much expansion that I just did without the Earth Serpent. Uh, Shinuyama frequently has problems like going up against that heavy cavalry, where there, whereas there are nations where you have powerful sacred units and you can just say, oh, look, there's some heavy cavalry there. It's kind of tough, but I don't really care and just run right headlong into them and kill them all. Uh, obviously those nations are going to be very good at expansion. Uh, it's a big advantage to be able to not care too much about Indies, not just because of how many provinces you can take, but that you can be more strategic in the order you take provinces. For example, like really what you want to do is take provinces that have like, that are like plains, just normal provinces that have a mixture of money and resources, and sometimes provinces like mountains or forests, so you can get the resources early on. And if those provinces happen to have heavy cavalry and you're playing a nation like Shinuyama, you don't really get the option to just capture them, uh, because there's a good chance your army will die. Whereas if you're playing a powerful nation like Vanheim, you can just walk all over them. Don't forget about scouting. Scouting is really important. Don't forget about rec recruiting indie commanders. Indie commanders are really important. If you'll notice, the only original commander I still have is my one and only original commander, my prophet. Um, the reason for that is that I've been recruiting mages this whole time for my capital, and uh, you want to get a lot of mages. Not every nation is going to be able to spend every single capital turn, starting from the beginning of the game, recruiting mages, but Shinoyama can do it, and because they can do it, you should do it. Um since it doesn't affect your expansion at all. Um, and recruiting so many mages so quickly is what allowed me to get this research. This is quite good research, actually, for the point in the game that we are at. Um, and 
hitting a good amount of research like this very quickly can be quite powerful. If I planned a little better, I might have an army ready to go. Like I might stop recruiting these guys. I've got I've got enough for a front line and recruit these really crappy Magamono archers. And if you look, like I can recruit a lot of these guys, like a lot of these guys in one turn. I was already talking about flaming arrows earlier, right? And so this is the this is like your final step before you get into the you know mid game and you start fighting people really rather than expanding. Is you do stuff like this and you spend two turns. If I'd done this two turns previously, started recruiting these this many guys at once every turn, I'd have quite a large army right now. And I'd have this fire three Pokemon of sorcerer, and I've got seventeen fire gems and. So I'd load him up on fire gems, and uh, I, I send him off to fight Agartha. Middle Agartha is actually a very powerful nation. They're kind of scary. I, I don't think I'd like to fight them, really. So is Pangea over there, um, and Asphodel. Actually, everyone I've surrounded myself with. But, you know, you might pick the person, either the person who's the most scary to you. Um, out of these guys, I'd say... Hmm, tough question. Uh, middle Pangea, probably. They, they look pretty pretty terrifying, actually, um, in a variety of ways, and lots of tiny archers. It's actually pretty good versus them. So either someone who's the most scary to you, uh, if you think you can beat them right now, or the person you think you can beat the easiest, if you don't think you can beat the scary guy right now, and remove them from the game by taking all their stuff. Um, that's a pretty good choice to make, if you can uh, feasibly pull it off at this point in the game. Uh, and you need to prepare yourself for going to war with players over the course of your expansion uh because i mean this is not this is not a you know a versus the ai type game the single player is really there for you to practice to get a little practice and uh it's it's not a you know game where you go out and kill all these independent guys you're you're fighting other players and you need to uh get any advantage you can over them because i tell you what other humans are tricky sons of bitches and they will uh, try all kinds of crazy stuff against you and uh, in a game this uh, deep and complex you're going to have a lot of surprises uh, in your time playing it all right well thank you very much uh, if you have any questions about expansion or the game in general please ask them and I, maybe I can do another video on something uh, that, that I've missed here. Uh, I'm not a perfect player and I'm a little bit new at making videos like this, so I'm sure there's probably some essential bit of information that you know just doesn't seem that uh, key to me anymore now that I'm a pretty experienced player and I've just gone up, glossed over it and not really uh, covered it in detail. And I'd love to make another you know short video or two covering any details like that that I may have missed or add annotations to this video where appropriate. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this video, and I will talk to you <laughs> talk to you later. See you again later. I need some good signing off catchphrase. Hmm, I'll have to think about that. All right, bye for now.